signal processing effects actually alter the sound itself. This can either be through spatial effects, where a sound can be made to seem as if it's being played in a range of different spaces, like a stadium or a concert hall, or an echo chamber. Or it can be through the use of a special effect that fundamentally alters the sound itself, like a chorus, flange, or a dramatic synthesizer pitch effect that you tend to hear on a lot of dance music at the moment. If you're recording, this is a huge area to learn about, but for live sound, this is not quite as pressing a concern, for two reasons. Spatial effects can be crucial in a recording because you want to create an atmosphere in which the music is seemingly taking place. Well, live it is taking place, and the reverberations and reflections that signal processors are recreating for you on record are quite often present and correct because your sound really is bouncing off walls and ceilings in a venue. So adding more reverb may only muddy your sound and make it less intelligible or less easy to understand. As for special effects, these are mainly applied to the sound of a specific instrument or part. So you're off the hook here as well, since the guitarist or keyboard player will probably be capable of, and indeed want to apply, these for themselves. For these reasons, we'll be keeping this part of our voyage of discovery fairly short. The most common spatial effect is reverb. Without any effect, or dry as engineers call it, the vocal is very present, very intimate, but also quite naked and unforgiving. Add reverb to a sound and it seems to be more natural, as it sounds as if it's been sung in an actual environment. It also sounds a bit more polished because you can't distinguish every little fluctuation and deviation in the performance. Now the sound will be called wet with reverb. Vocalists love reverb. Reverb units are generally patched into an aux bus on your mixing desk, so that any channel can share the effect. This way, all the different sources will sound as if they're coming from the same environment, making the sound more natural and believable. While each channel can use different amounts of reverb, it's important to understand that you can only use one setting or patch on the reverb unit at a time. The moral of this story is to look for a setting that will suit a wide variety of sounds. Yamaha has been producing excellent digital reverb units for a great many years now. You can, as many people do, simply flip through the presets and find a general tone of reverb that suits your particular purpose or venue. If you're playing in the Spectrum in Philly, you probably won't need a very long reverb time. The Spectrum Bar and Grill, that only holds 150 people, well, yes, you probably can afford to use longer times to create the illusion of playing in a basketball stadium. Avoid using reverb on sources that don't benefit from the effect. An example would be a bass guitar or a kick drum. These sounds would only be muddied. A good rule is that higher frequency sources like a snare drum, vocals or a cymbal are candidates that would benefit from reverb. Delay effects are actually very closely related to reverb, but where reverbs don't tend to have defined repeats or echoes, that's exactly what you want in a delay. You want the snare to sound... and then hear... in probably decreasing volume and preferably in time with the beat of your song. Some singers use a trademark echo or delay, 1950s slapback echo for instance, and sometimes a song or even a style of music like Jamaican dub demand the use of delays. These are perfectly legitimate applications, but in general it's best not to smother your mix with delays, as it can get quite wearing on the ears. Although most special effects like chorus or flanging will be applied by a player on stage, occasionally you may need to pull something out of the hat yourself. Some chorusing on a vocal, or the aforementioned synthesizer vocal pitch effect. Depending upon the size of your system, you may want to plug in a multi-effects processor in line on a channel. Or you may have enough AUX buses that you can afford to simply use one just for the occasional special effect. Is it worth spending money buying the dedicated effects units as opposed to using the effects that might already be built into your mixer? That's a difficult one. And in fact the answer is made even more difficult when you consider digital mixers. If you're running a small rig with a powered mixer, like the EMX68S, that will deliver all the reverb and delays and special effects that you're realistically going to need. 
Plus, it has an effects bypass jack, so that you can use a foot switch to mute the effect when you don't need it. This is all excellent if you're mixing yourself. Leapfrog up to a medium priced digital mixer like the O1 V96, and not only have you got four super high quality signal processing effects built in, you can also apply digital compression, limiting and even noise gates on every single channel. Imagine the cost of buying, say, 16 individual pieces of equipment. So this is going to be a massive cost saving. If you're using a more modest featured analog mixing desk, then a top quality dedicated reverb unit can give your sound a coating of quality that makes complete economic sense.